All right, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the final talk in the fall 2021 Anthropology Colloquium series uh, at the University of New Mexico. I'm super excited for today's speaker, uh, but before I introduce them, I, I want to remind you that um, based on the recommendation of the Association of Indigenous Anthropologists, I will not be reading the UNM land acknowledgement today in order to enable a, a task force to, to recommend improvements. I also want to remind you to uh, please turn off your cameras during the talk and save your questions until the end. If you have uh, questions and you want to make sure that you don't forget them, feel free to drop them in the chat, but uh, we'll, we'll address them uh, at the, the end of the talk. Okay, with that said, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Evelyn Jagoda or Evi. Um, uh, Dr. Evi recently finished their PhD in human evolutionary biology at Harvard University. Their PhD research focused on connecting genetic variation that entered the human gene pool via interbreeding with Neanderthals with the biological and fitness impact of this genetic contribution on modern humans in the past and present. Uh, their work integrates population genetics approaches with cutting edge, high throughput functional genetics uh, uh, approaches to identify putatively, adaptively intergressed genetic sequences and to explore their effects on genetic regulation and cellular phenotypes. Dr. Jagoda is currently a research scientist at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, where they continue to work to connect genetic variation to biology by building maps of non-coding regulation of the human genome. So based on that description of their research, I suspect that you can tell that Evi is pretty smart. Uh, but in addition to that, I will say that Evi is also a super funny person and a very nice person. And I'm proud to call Evi a friend of mine. And I'm sure you'll be very impressed with their research as well. Evi, thanks very much for, for, for joining us today. Wow, Ian, thank you so much. That was such a nice intro. And uh, yeah, thank you all for having me here. I'm very excited to share my research with you. Um, yeah, so let's dive in. I'll basically be giving an overview of my PhD research and there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. So I would love to, to get into it. So my PhD focused on the biological consequences and adaptive value of Neanderthal intergress genetic variation in modern humans. So as I'm sure you all know, um, what we've learned throughout um, recent years is that human evolution operated such that multiple hominin groups existed contemporaneously. So if we imagine the time period from around 200,000 to 55,000 years ago, you had a situation where there were multiple hominin groups all um, existing at the same time, but predominantly in different locations. So you had modern humans predominantly in Africa, with Neanderthals in Europe and Asia, Denisovans we believe in Asia, and then other groups that we know um, less about in the Southeast Asian island regions, so Homo forensiensis and other populations as well. And so these hominin groups existed at the same time. Um, and what we know is that migration also allowed these hominin groups to come into contact with each other. So around 55,000 years ago, a small group of humans dispersed out of Africa and for the first time came into contact with some of these archaic hominin groups. So through this dispersal, modern humans interacted with uh, or came into the physical location of Neanderthals and Denisovans. And we know that not, not only did they um, physically move into the same space, but actually modern humans interbred with Neanderthals as well. And we know that because looking at the genomes of all living descendants of this migration today, so all people alive today with some non-African ancestry have around 1.8 to 2.6% of their genomes deriving from Neanderthals. So we know that this gene flow occurred. And in fact, this isn't the only instance of gene flow among hominin groups in human history. We know from genetic evidence that um, Denisovans interbred with modern humans as well, contributing small fractions of the genomes of Melanesian, East Asian, and South Asian populations. And there's also interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans as well. So this tells us that this situation of migration leading to contact, leading to gene flow was actually not necessarily rare in human evolution, but maybe um, a, a large, a large impact, maybe had a large impact on our actual evolutionary history. And, oh, and furthermore, looking at the genomes of modern humans today uh, alive in Africa, as well as um, ancient, gene, ancient DNA from Denisovans, there was even more gene flow than we even um, originally suspected 
with unknown archaic hominin groups that we don't even know what these populations are, but we can see the signature of this gene flow in these other um, other genome samples today. So this idea of gene flow is really seems to be to some degree the norm throughout human evolutionary history. And so the intermittent event that we'll be talking about throughout this talk today that my PhD research focused on is this gene flow between humans and Neanderthals. But we can think of this as to some degree reflective of a broader process um, in human evolutionary history. And so zooming in on this uh, instance of Neanderthal interbreeding or gene flow or introgression, which is the what we call the genetic material from Neanderthals in modern humans, this we can see that this Neanderthal introgression is present in all people with some non-Sub-Saharan African ancestry today. So looking at this plot, you can see the yellow um, spheres are populations with basically no Neanderthal ancestry fraction, which are only Sub-Saharan African populations. Um, and then that fraction of Neanderthal ancestry is somewhat variable throughout the rest of the world um, with you know, some lower levels around 1.5% you know, um, in Northern African populations. Um, with an increasing fraction um, towards East Asia, around 2%, 2.2% in East Asian populations, and with the highest fraction in Melanesian individuals, those people indigenous to Papua New Guinea and Australia. Although to some degree, this ancestry amount is to some degree confounded with the Denisovan ancestry portion. But in general, what we know is that Neanderthal introgression does exist in all these populations, but it's somewhat variable. And so when we think about you know, what the impact of this Neanderthal DNA in all these human populations was, um, researchers have sampled the genomes of ancient human uh, samples across time. So all of these plots here show the genome of a human individual throughout the last 45,000 years. And what you can see is for almost all of the samples, except this one outlier, the fraction of Neanderthal ancestry over time decreased in the last 45,000 years. And this single outlier seems to be an individual that did not directly contribute to human, uh, human ancestry today. So that's not a human ancestor. But all these other samples are and found there's this decrease in Neanderthal ancestry, suggesting that on the whole, Neanderthal DNA um, ex experienced negative selection in the human gene pool. So the idea would be that individuals with more Neanderthal DNA had some maladaptive impact from that, therefore had lower fitness, lower reproduction, and that fraction of Neanderthal ancestry decreased over time because of that maladaptive effect. However, when we look at the remaining fraction of Neanderthal DNA in people today, there is still, there are some segments of Neanderthal DNA, which we call haplotypes, that are at high frequency in populations. So these plots show the frequency of different haplotypes in different human populations today. And these uh, red dots are haplotypes that are at extremely elevated frequency in populations, where you'll have a Neanderthal haplotype that's at around uh, upwards of 50% frequency in a given population. And that is thought to be evidence of positive selection. So some pieces of this Neanderthal DNA contribution in the human gene pool may have actually been adaptive and been subject to therefore positive selection. But you know, why should this Neanderthal DNA be under positive selection? So if we consider the environmental context in which the interbreeding occurred, modern humans were existing only in Africa for almost our entire evolutionary history. Whereas for about 200,000 years before modern humans came, entered the environment, Neanderthals were living in Europe and Asia and therefore adapting to that landscape and maybe picked up genetic adaptations to this landscape that through interbreeding, modern humans may have actually acquired from Neanderthals. So for example, Neanderthals were likely adapted to the colder climate, decreased daylight, novel food sources and novel immune stimuli that existed particularly in the Eurasian landscape and modern humans were not adapted to. So by interbreeding with Neanderthals, we may have picked up some of these adaptations. And in particular, in my PhD, I focused on this uh, idea of the novel immune stimuli that may have been present in Eurasia, which I'll talk about um, throughout this talk. So the overall question of my PhD was basically, why was some of this Neanderthal introgress genetic variation under positive selection? And how does it affect human biology? And I'll talk about the kind of three approaches that I took to this question and three, the three studies I did. Focusing first on 
the idea of this dynamics of this positive selection, basically asking what environmental pressures led to positive selection on interior Neanderthal genetic variation. Then the rest of my PhD really focused on trying to connect Neanderthal genetic variation, the genotype, to the actual phenotypes. First, looking at which genetic variants drive selection on immune phenotypes in humans and how those genetic variants affect immune phenotypes. And finally, looking specifically at the case in which Neanderthal intergress genetic variation variants actually seem to contribute to severe COVID-19 risk um, and exploring that connection. So I'll first talk briefly about this question of the environmental pressures. And so this work um, was published in a paper in Molecular Biology and Evolution in 2017. And I'd like to specifically um, credit all my co-authors and in particular, Luca Pagani of the, the Estonian Biocenter and Dan Lawson as well. And we had a basic question um, for this paper, which was when and where did positive selection on Neanderthal intergress variation occur? Because you could kind of imagine three models. So in one instance, you have Neanderthal DNA entering the human gene pool and basically very soon after undergoing positive selection. So it enters the gene pool, it's immediately adaptive and therefore rises in frequency in this population that's ancestral to all Eurasian um, populations. So the rise in frequency happens there and then those haplotypes are carried through as these populations disperse across Eurasia. Another option is that the gene flow occurred, but segregated relatively neutrally for a while. So you have these haplotypes existing in the populations, undergoing recombination, going with populations as they disperse across the Eurasian landscape. And only much later when, for example, a population enters a new environmental condition under which a haplotype becomes uh, adaptive, does that positive selection occur. So that's a much more recent time scale. And finally, you can have some sort of combination where uh, haplotypes initially go pos undergo positive selection, but subsequently become maladaptive in a new environment or are subject to genetic drift and kind of um, are removed from the population via those forces. And what we found through uh, implementation of a variety of populations genetic statistics are is that the vast majority of Neanderthal introgression, if it underwent positive selection, underwent positive selection on that much more recent time scale. So around 96% of the haplotypes we attributed to a more recent time scale of selection. And this is reflected in the fact that these intergressed haplotypes that, are, that seem to have undergone positive selection are largely population specific. So 60% of the haplotypes we identified that were under positive selection are present in only one of the nine populations that we looked at, and these were populations around the world. So this tells us that when we're thinking about positive selection on Neanderthal intergress variation, we should be looking at environmental pressures in local, the lo local more recent populations where positive selection acted locally well after the out of Africa dispersal, and we need to look for those local population specific selection pressures to understand uh, the impetus for positive selection on these haplotypes. But I really wanted to go deeper and really try to understand, you know, get down to that phenotypic level. And I did this by approaching, you know, connecting the idea of intergress Neanderthal genotypes to those phenotypes. So before I get into this, I want to kind of set up why this is so difficult. So the, part of the issue is that adaptively intergressed haplotypes contain many linked genetic variants. So if you imagine each one of these black bars represents a chromosome and each of the stars represents a genetic variant, you'll have an instance where there's one variant, this red star, which does something important, which can cha changes the DNA in such a way that it leads to an adaptive phenotypic change. And that's indicated with this red star but it just happens to be on a chromosome nearby two other genetic variants that don't have any particularly important function, no, no important function at all. And we call these linked genetic variants. And what happens is as individuals with this beneficial mutation pass this chromosome along, uh, pass this chromosome on more disproportionately, you get a rise in frequency both of the beneficial or the driver variant and the linked variants as well that just happen to be so close to that variant that they um, and the, the haplotype rise in frequency so quickly that these variants are not broken up by recombination and remain with that 
and rise in frequency along with the link variant as well. And we even call these uh, genetic hitchhikers because they just come along for the ride in the selective force. But then if we're looking at you know, individuals today, the frequency of all these variants, the two non-important and the one driver variant, the frequency is all the same. So we can't just a priori know which variant is actually driving an adaptive signal. And this is made further more difficult because intragast genetic variation lies largely in the non-coding part of the genome. So in the DNA, so if you imagine again that this uh, gray bar here is a chromosome, you have the coding region of the gene, which is the part that will actually be transcribed into RNA, but you also have other pieces of the genome that act to regulate the expression of that gene. So you have an enhancer and promoter sequences that transcription factors and other proteins need to bind to, to allow transcription of the coding part of the genome to occur. So even though we know that these regulatory sequences exist, the location and function of most of these is unknown. So when we combine these two factors together, what we think is happening is that for the majority of Neanderthal intergrest variants, these driver variants will act by, by altering a regulatory sequence in some way. So for example, altering an enhancer sequence that in some way impacts the binding of this protein or the conformational change that is induced by this enhancer sequence that will have the primary phenotypic effect be a change in the expression of the gene. So we believe that these Neanderthal driver variants will alter gene expression rather than um, a gene sequence, a, a gene sequence change. Uh, yeah, a gene sequence change. And so in order to really understand what these phenotypic effects are, we need to know which, which variants are driver variants, which regulatory sequences they fall in, and how those variants alter those genetic sequences, the, those regulatory genetic sequences, which is a multi-step uh, problem. So I'm gonna present this workflow that we use to help do this, to help identify these driver variants and connect these to the resulting phenotype. So we start by identifying variants on positively selected haplotypes and then put them through this massively parallel reporter assay, which I'll describe in more detail in a minute. Um, but this assay allows us to identify of these variants, which ones actually affect gene expression. So this will help us, this basically separates out variants that have no effect, which are likely our linked variants from potential driver variants that in some way alter the expression of the gene. Once we know this smaller set of expression modulating variants that have these effects on gene expression, then we can integrate those variants with other data sets to predict the response of, of, you know, of how that driver variant is important. So for example, we can look at, okay, if we know that this variant um, does something regulatory, we can say, what promoter sequence does this come into contact with when this conformational change occurs? You know, what transcription factors bind to that variant and might be altered by having the Neanderthal variant versus the non-Neanderthal variant. Finally, we can look at, you know, what changes in gene expression are associated with this variant and what phenotypes are associated with this. And all of these questions we can dig into much deeper when we know the identity of these driver variants. And then finally, when we have, you know, integrated all this information and have very strong evidence that this driver variant is important, we can do follow-up lab experiments where we do things like use CRISPR to knock out the variant itself or the regulatory element that it lies in, that enhancer or promoter sequence, knock those out and see what the effect is. We can also do follow-up reporter assays that will be more specific to the variant of interest. Those is our kind of overall workflow for identifying um, and connecting driver variants to phenotype. So for the second chapter of my dissertation, I focused in specifically on identifying and connecting genetic variants, introduced from Neanderthals to immune specific phenotypes. And the reason I focused on the immune system is that there's been repeated evidence that Neanderthal adaptive variation has impacted the immune system. And this comes from um, particularly associations between Neanderthal genetic variants and immune phenotypes um, through genetic association studies and things like this. And of course, the immune system is, so, is such a critical system. If we could understand the phenotypes produced by Neanderthal introgression, it could not only inform human, uh, human evolution, but human health as well. 
So um, this work uh, was uh, is now published in Molecular Biology and Evolution in the 2021 paper that it's, it's up there now in advanced access. Um, and I'd like to thank my co-authors on this, specifically James Zhu and Steve Riley from Hardy Sabeti's lab um, at the Broad Institute. And so what we did for this paper, we followed our workflow. So step one is to identify variants on positively selected haplotypes. And specifically, we wanted to create a geographically diverse set of variants for this study. Because if we remember from the previous work, we know that the majority of these selection incidents happen in, pop in local populations and are specific to a particular population. So unless we pull from a lot of different populations, we'll only be getting a very small fraction of all the potentially relevant Neanderthal genetic variation. So in order to create the most diverse set possible, we pulled from genome sequences from three huge um, genome sequence databases, um, which contain across the, which contain DNA information from individuals across the globe, upwards of 20 populations. And we looked, we mined through all these genomes to find around 60,000 uh, variants that putatively fall along positively selective Neanderthal intragrass haplotypes. And for the first uh, test of this uh, concept, we did a pilot experiment looking at 10% of these variants approximately. So we tested around 5,000 variants. And so we have this set of 5,353 intragrass variants from across 20 populations and put it into our massively parallel reporter assay. So the way that this assay works it, so we start with the reporter assay, which is just basically a circular piece of DNA that derives originally from a bacteria. And it has on it a reporter gene, this um, GFP sequence, which is a codes for a protein that turns green. But all that matters is that we really know the, the, um, the sequence of this transcript. The function of it is irrelevant. So we have this reporter gene. And upstream of it, we have the um, intergust variant that we're interested in as well in the context of 170 base pairs. So the variant is in the middle, and then we have 85 base pairs on either side, which basically gives us the intergress variant and the potential regulatory element that it lies in. So whether that's an enhancer or promoter, we have as much of that sequence as we can fit in this vector. And then at the end of the GFP coding sequence is a unique genetic barcode, which is just 20 random base pairs of DNA, uh, of DNA so that when the GFP is transcribed, it's basically a tag. No, so we can say that this GFP transcript came from this particular vector. And that's important because we're not just going to make the intergress version of this vector, we're also going to make the exact same vector, but just with the non intergress allele um, in, the, in the middle position here. So then we could take these two, trans, uh, these two reporter vectors, tra uh, transfect them into a pool of cells. The cells will uptake these reporter vectors and transcribe the DNA, the GFT code sequence. And depending on whether this, uh, this element actually is a regulatory element and whether the intergressed or non intergressed allele has an effect on that gene expression, we might get a different amount of gene expression. So in this particular case, if we did this experiment and found three transcripts with the barcode associated with the non intergress vector, whereas only one barcode associated with the intergress vector, this would tell us that the effect of the intergress allele is to decrease gene expression in some way, because we had only you know, a, a third of the amount of expression from the intergress vectors as the non intergress vectors. And this system is amazing because of these genetic barcodes, we actually can do this on a massive scale where we can transfect thousands of these vectors, all with unique genetic barcodes to a dish of cells and get information on all of our 5,000 variants all at the same time. And for this type of experiment, the cell type that you use is extremely important because that's gonna be the context, the cellular environment that your um, vectors are being transcribed in. And so for this experiment, we used K562 cells, which are a erythroleukemic multipotent cell line. So it's a cancer cell, so it makes it very easy to use. Um, and it has been shown to have phenotypes such that it spontaneously differentiates into a variety of immune of different immune cells. So basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. And it also has properties of erythrocytes as well. So it's this kind of multipotent immune cell that expresses lots and lots of transcription factors relevant to immune and blood cell phenotypes um, that make it useful for our question about immune phenotypes. 
So we did this experiment and of the 5,000 approximately variants that we tested, we found that 292 of them or 5.5% had an effect on gene expression. So we call those EMVARs or gene expression modulating variants, these variants that have an effect. And so, you know, you can see, so we have here on the x-axis is the activity of the non-interest allele, and the y-axis is the activity of the interest allele. And so variants that fall along the, the line plotted here have no difference in effect, where the expression is exactly the same in the non-interest and interest forms. And as you can see, there are some variants that deviate from this, where the or orange alleles, the interest alleles have higher expression than the non-interest alleles, and the green alleles show higher expression in the non-interest condition. So we've now identified these 292 variants that have effects on gene expression. And now we want to you know, understand what do they do? What is the impact of their effects on gene expression? So as I described before, we will integrate these variants with other data sets to um, make predictions. And then for those variants that we have good evidence for, we can do follow-up lab experiments. So I'll go into detail on one of these variants for which we did all this um, follow-up analysis. So we tested this one haplotype, which had on chromosome 12, which was at highest frequency in Melanesian individuals. It was about at 50% frequency in the Melanesian populations that we sampled. And there were 20 variant Neanderthal variants along this haplotype that are plotted up here. And the, uh, the next line, the next track here is from the UCSC genome browser showing the different genes that these variants fall near. And when we tested these 20 variants in our MPRA, we found three of them to be expression modulating variants denoted with these red stars. And so then we integrated this information with other data sets, looking, for example, at enhancer chromatin marks. So these are um, marks on the actual chromatin structure of the, of the chromatin that are reflective of, of portions of the genome that act as enhancers. And you can see there's a lot of consistency where our expression modulating variants seem to be falling in peaks of potential enhancer activity. And these variants are also associated with changes in expression of three important genes, IL-23A, STAT2, and PAN2, all of which have um, known immune effects. So we wanted to follow up on these. So I have plotted out here the MPRA results for each of these three um, alleles, where you have the blue shows the non interest allele activity and the uh, purple shows the interest allele activity. And then we did a single locus reporter assay for each of these variants, which is essentially very similar in principle to the, um, the massively parallel reporter assay. We would test each vector one at a time in its own dish of cells. And instead of the output of this experiment being um, RNA levels, so the transcription, it's the fluorescence of a protein. So it gets us to a question of, do these, do these alleles affect protein levels, not just, uh, not just transcription levels? And we found for one of our variants, we had great consistency um, that, uh, in the single locus assay compared to the massively parallel reporter assay. So for this um, SNP2, there was both a significant effect in both assays and in the same direction, where in both assays, the, um, the Neanderthal allele downregulated uh, gene expression. So then we followed up on this by doing a CRISPR knockout study um, where I made two different deletions in these KFAS2 cells. So in one instance, I deleted the entire, I used CRISPR-Cas9 to delete the entire region, uh, that entire 170 base pairs that were originally um, included in those reporter assays. So that's kind of a proxy for knocking out the whole enhancer. Um, and then I also made a smaller deletion knocking out just the 32 base pairs, a small deletion right around the allele itself. And what I found was that in both cases, um, in both deletions, PAN2 and SAT2 were downregulated. So relative to the non-deleted conditions. So that tells us that the interest variant, which we uh, falls within an enhancer that normally increases the expression of these genes, right? Because deleting this region decreased the expression. So it lies in an enhancer for these genes. And we know from the uh, reporter assays that the allele decreases the activity of this enhancer. So it leads to an overall decrease in the expression of these genes. And so what, you know, now, now that we have this information, we can really go deep on, you know, what is the function of these genes and what might that 
down regulation be important for? So both STAT2 and PAN2 are upregulated in flu infections. And this data comes from this Quach et al. paper, where they found that if you take cells with two different genetic backgrounds, one African, one European, and infect the cells with flu, both SAT2 and PAN2 are upregulated. So they're having this immune effect. And in particular, SAT2 is known to be a very key mediator of an important immune response system, where particularly when microbial products stimulate um, an immune cell, it triggers this interferon cascade, and SAT2 is one of the key mediators of this. So even though STAT2 is very important, overexpression of STAT2 can have negative phenotypic consequences. So in this one paper, they test, they looked at lungs of hamsters that were infected with COVID-19. And what they found was that when you deleted STAT2, so it, in, in normal hamsters, you see this lung pathology, you see this um, damage to the lung tissue when they are infected with COVID-19. But if you delete STAT2, that pathology goes away. And so that suggests that this, that, you know, as you get in the title of the paper, an exuberant response, like an over response of STAT2 actually has this damaging effect on lung, cell, on lung tissue. And one potential um, reason why this happens is that you get during various infections, COVID, as well as flu and pneumonia, you can get a buildup of platelet cells, which are coming to the scene in order to um, facilitate uh, clotting and you know, to, to be helpful. But the buildup of the buildup of these platelet fibrin clots actually damages the lung tissue. So you can have the situation where this immune, uh, this, um, this immune gene, which has an important function, is actually its expression is leading to damage. And SAT2 is associated with the volume of platelets in the blood, and so is our interest allele. And in particular, the interest allele is associated with a decrease in the platelet volume. So potentially a decrease in that platelet-induced uh, platelet injury. So when we put all this data together, we can make this hypothesis that this particular interest variant decreases STAT2 expression, which reduces the risk of hyperstat 2 mediated disease complications, including this platelet-induced lung damage. So this is just a hypothesis. More work would be needed to be done to prove that this is the um, adaptive significance of this. But by identifying this driver variant, we're really able to go very deep into making a, a clear adaptive hypothesis as to why it may have been under positive selection. And in the paper, we can describe a few other specific hypotheses of other interest variants as well, looking particularly at an expression modulating variant, which we were able to find the particular binding change of a transcription factor, which it affects, and downregulates um, another gene, which I confirmed with a CRISPR knockout and may have an effect on flu response. We also identified four expression modulating variants that downregulate GMEB2 and might provide decreased risk of gastrointestinal disease in Asian populations. And we also investigated an expression modulating variant that upregulates FAM114A um, for A1, which leads to increased activation of the TLR pathway, which might be contributing to allergy and asthma risk in Europeans and East Asian populations today. So, Zooming out on what we did here with this paper, we identified 292 putative interest driver variants that, um, I, that affect immune phenotypes, including particularly flu response in Melanesian individuals, which was the example I, I dove into, flu response in Europeans, protection against gastrointestinal disease, and allergy and asthma risk. And overall, we also proved this broader point that by following up this, by following this workflow where we take the effort and time and money to identify the driver variants of these positive selective signals, we're able to make much more specific biological hypotheses, which is um, really the kind of next step that's needed um, in the investigation of Neanderthal intergress genetic variation. And finally, we um, did, did another study following basically the same workflow, specifically investigating this COVID-19 risk association. So this work was done um, with the help of a variety of collaborators, in particular, David Marinetto and Luca Pagani from the Estonian Biocenter and Daniel Richard, who's a member of uh, the Capolini lab where I did my uh, PhD at Harvard. 
And this work is currently under review at, at eLife. And so in 2020, it came out that, um, so as we all know, when, when people get infected with COVID-19, there's a variety of different phenotypic responses ranging from nothing, like basically no symptoms at all to very severe symptoms, including fatal symptoms. And what uh, Zyberg and Pabo found is that there is a genetic component of these differing phenotypes and that the major risk factor for having a severe response to COVID-19 is actually inherited from the adults. So obviously this was extremely um, interesting to me and in interesting to me and so important to follow up. And we already had the tools to investigate why this sort of association might occur. So I basically followed the exact workflow that I described for intercast variants in immune function in general, focusing just on this Neanderthal uh, this COVID-19 associated Neanderthal haplotype. So following our workflow, we identified 613 variants on the intergrass risk haplotype, put it through uh, the MPRA, which we conducted in the same cell type that I described before. And what we found is that there were 20 variants that were expression modulating. So 20 variants where there was that change in expression based on the presence or absence of the intergrass allele. And then I, Basically, I intersected these 20 variants with a variety of different data sets. So looking at the strength of the association between the individual variants and the COVID-19 phenotype, the association of those variants with the expression of various genes, the, 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 um, whether those gene expressions match other things like promoter interactions and chromatin marks. And basically I, I identified four top candidates from this 20 variant set that showed strong evidence of being potentially the disease causing, the disease associating variants. And of these four variants, three of them are associated with changes in CCR1 expression. And one is associated with changes in CCR5 expression. And both of these genes are chemokine receptor genes, which is extremely important. So when we think about COVID-19, you may have heard the phrase cytokine storm and CCR1 and CCR5 are both involved with these. So just some terminology, cytokines are an immune messenger molecule and chemokines are just a particular type of cytokine. And so what happens in COVID-19 infection, you get the virus infecting lung cells through this ACE2 receptor. The cells die, and in their death, they release inflammatory signaling molecules, which act to activate macrophages, which then release more inflammatory molecules, um, which lead to the recruitment of T cells, and that starts a positive feedback loop, where the recruitment of T cells to go fight the virus leads to more release of inflammatory cytokines, which activates the macrophages to release more inflammatory molecules. And you get what's called the cytokine storm, where you have an overexpression of this positive feedback loop and more and more immune cells, which as we've described before, sometimes the hyper response of these immune cells and all this inflammation can have damaging phenotypes. And it seems that this over uh, cytokine response, the cytokine storm, is actually the thing that primarily leads to the most damaging phenotypes from COVID-19 infection. And the two genes that I found associated with um, these Neanderthal and stress variants are specifically found to be, so they've done, uh, researchers have tested uh, the blood of individual, of patients with severe responses to COVID-19 versus more mild conditions. And it found that the patients with severe COVID-19 have an upregulation of CCR1 and to a lesser degree CCR5. And these are chemokine receptors. So things that, these are receptor molecules for these chemokines, which would therefore naturally, you know, if you have more expression of the receptor, you're uptaking more of the signaling molecules. Um, and this just would lead to a further induction of this cytokine storm. So it seems like a very plausible mechanism by which this Neanderthal interest variation could be impacting response to COVID-19. So more work is currently um, underway to prove this connection. You know, we have this great hypothesis for why this is happening. And two of my collaborators, Arunjay uh, Baranji and Gayani, uh, who's, uh, who's at my, um, current, my uh, PhD lab at Harvard, are, are working to do two follow-up assays where they basically redo um, the single locus reporter assay, which I described before, but replace the promoter of the vector. We have been using like a generic promoter in these vectors 
and substituting those specifically with the CCR1 or CCR5 promoter, which would really prove the impact of these integrass variants on that uh, expression of that gene in particular. And also testing the transfection of these vectors in not just a baseline pool of cells, but a pool of cells actually infected with COVID-19. So when these experiments are done, we'll be able to see in the infection condition with the promoters of the genes that we think are the most relevant ones, do we actually see an impact of having that interest allele, which would of course be very, uh, very, very impactful in terms of understanding why people have different responses to COVID-19 and how um, our human evolutionary history actually potentially is impacting that. So um, in summary, on this final study, we were able to determine that integration potentially alters CCR1 and CCR5 regulation, which contributes to the COVID-19 cytokine storm, potentially affecting, uh, protecting patient outcomes. So overall, when I like zoom out on all this research that I've done for my PhD, um, and this question of why was some intragress Neanderthal genetic variation under positive selection and how does it affect human biology today? In summary, I found that Neanderthal intragress variation contributes genetic variation that was selected in local populations and contributes to important immune phenotypes that continue to have potentially major impacts on our biology today. But there's a lot more work to be done in this area. So in particular, I said, you know, when I talked about chapter two, that we tested around 5,000 variants, but we had identified close to 60,000 variants that are, that are introduced from Neanderthals. And I designed the vectors to be able to test that 90% of other of variants that I did not test already. And that work is ongoing um, in the Capellini lab at Harvard, where um, that assay will be done on the other 90% of variants in immune cells and also in other cell types. So uh, work is being done to repeat these assays in a variety of different cell types so we can see the effect of Neanderthal integration, not just on immune cells, but other cell types as well. And you know, from that initial study, I, I identified 292 driver variants and only really did intensive follow-up on two to four, depending on uh, the level of intensity. So there's a lot more um, that can be dug into there. And my hope is that by you know, our lab taking the time and money to identify these driver variants, it will be a lot easier for other people to do those um, next follow-up studies because we've already pruned out and shown that these variants do have some effect. Um, but as you can see from, uh, from the uh, intensity of the, the work that I did here, it's still very labor intensive to make these genotype phenotype connections. You know, I did my whole PhD and spent all this time and effort on these experiments and really am only able to make, you know, hypotheses and only get down to, you know, some level and it takes a lot of work. Um, however, new technologies currently exist that would allow the potential to basically map out all of the non-coding regulatory elements. So basically ID, identify all of the enhancers, promoters, repressors, all these non-coding regulatory elements throughout the human genome, throughout a variety of different cell types, such that we can have a map saying, you know, so you don't have to necessarily go through the effort of yourself identifying all these regulatory elements, but you could just find a variant, look it up in this like uh, regulatory map and find out, okay, this lies in an enhancer in the cell type and even further have um, knowledge of what the uh, regulatory impact of making that, uh, of that genetic variant, you know, making that allelic change. So the technology to have these maps exists. It's just really a matter of time, money and effort to actually do these. And so my current role at the Brown Institute is part of a team that is working to do just this. We're part of a, a huge um, initiative that the Broad is undertaking in, with uh, collaborators in Denmark to actually really invest in creating these maps. And this would be like a revolutionary change to um, the genomics field and would make, basically my goal is that by the end of, uh, you know, in the like two to five year time span of my new role, I could have done my whole PhD in like, uh, in a couple months instead of six years. So uh, that is the cool thing about science. We can always be improving it. That would be, um, yeah, have a, have a really huge impact. So um, great, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I would just like to acknowledge my PhD supervisor, Terence Capellini, without whom none of this work would be possible. All my project collaborators, especially um, Luca Pagani, Dan Lawson, James Zeus, Steve Riley, Liz Brown, Ryan Tui, David Marnetto, and Daniel Richard. Uh, the Capellini Lab, uh, Ian for inviting me 
to talk here today, which I am so grateful to be able to do, um, and my funding sources. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I'd love to take any questions. <laughs> thank you very much, Evie. That was wonderful. Um, uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? If you do, just go ahead and uh, turn on your camera and, and, and ask the question. Um, I'd be happy to, to get us going with a question. Um, and it, my question actually relates uh, to, to something you said early on in the talk um, about the timing of uh, positive selection events. Uh, and I, I thought that was really interesting. So the, when you said that like a lot of it is very local, so are you, is the scenario basically that at roughly like the same time, there's a lot of uh, like local positive selection happening uh, locally in a variety of places? And if so, why <laughs> at that time, you know, like why would these like multiple events take place at sort of uh, a particular time? Right, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And so in terms of the level of like specificity of that time scale, it's not super specific. So we basically were able to say, was it sooner or basically, so the way we did the analysis was basically comparing, uh, did the selection occur before or after European and East Asian populations separated from each other? So we know that, uh, the, inter that the major pulse of interbreeding occurred in like the common ancestor of those populations. And we could basically test, did selection occur before or after that? But that gives you basically, so we know it's mostly after, but that's on the order of any time basically in the last 30 to 5,000 years was like the specificity of that time scale. So I don't think it's like, bam, 20,000 years ago, all these selective events are necessarily happening simultaneously. However, I think that there's kind of two major things contributing to this. So one is that you have these populations, you know, roughly, you know, starting at the same time point, originating out of Africa around 55,000 years ago and kind of moving across into these new environments so that you know takes some time where then populations are kind of uh existing in these new locales and i think the other piece is that we're, what's also happening is so i i presented how neanderthal dna was mostly maladaptive right so you have this negative selection occurring so i think that the other major piece is there had to be time for if you imagine you know the first generation after interbreeding has a whole set of neanderthal chromosomes right and then over time, those chromosomes are being broken up by recombination. So you're getting like a, a mix of a human Neanderthal chromosome. And so I think possibly what happened is over time, you get enough recombination that some of those maladaptive variants are separated from potentially adaptive variants. And therefore you can have you know, a, a chunk that's now all beneficial and the uh, potentially maladaptive portion has been selected out. So I think, those are kind of like two things happening together where you're having migration and recombination kind of uh, separating those out. But like basically my conclusion that was like so much more work needs to be done in that area. Um, yeah. And I, I oh, that, that's really, really that. interesting. That makes sense. That, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions? Lawrence, do you have a question? I can't hear you, Lawrence. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, I still can't see, hear you. Let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, I'm unmuted now. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, yeah. excellent. Now, Go ahead. I'm entirely filling the screen. So I'm a, a, a very interesting talk, of course, largely incomprehensible to the stones and bones archaeologist. Uh, however, as, as you may or may not know, uh, I discovered a 19,000 year old burial and the DNA was done by Svante Pabo uh, and it was follow up by uh, the Reich Laboratory, uh, QMA Fu, and now uh, Christina Warner uh, and company. And, and recently, recently uh, they published, this is uh, James Fellows Yates uh, at, um, at Jena and, and Christina Warner published uh, on, um, uh, bacteria from the dental cementum of our Delanian burial. And uh, they, they find that this individual shared bacteria with the Neanderthals who had gone extinct some 20,000 years before. And interestingly, uh, not too long after 19,000 years ago, about 14 or so thousand years ago, uh, 
these bacteria disappear. Uh, further work is underway by uh, this group in Jena and others on, on DNA from the, the Elmiron Cave Red Lady, uh, including the possibility that some of some of the some of uh, the, the bacteria may have been uh, helpful, uh, basically, uh, and trying to recover evidence uh, for this uh, in the sediments of the cave, which is what we've been doing this summer a little bit, uh, not this summer, this fall. My question is, do we have other evidence of, of Neanderthal uh, beans disappearing uh, after, after the long period of apparent continuation of, of genetic uh, signal, basically, the Neanderthals towards the end of the Upper Paleolithic? So that's sort of, sort of a question as well as a comment, a, a greeting, as it were. <laughs> totally. That, that's very interesting. I, I think all that work is, is so interesting with the bacterial components. Um, and, and I think the answer to your question is yes. So let me just uh, scroll back a little bit. Um, so, uh, it's a lot of slides here. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, so here is, is work that basically addressed this question. So what they did for this study is took samples of, you know, from DNA from humans across the last 45,000 years. And basically on over on the whole of this sample. So there's this one sample, OS1, which seems, this is the um, outlier up at the top, which seems to be a descendant of a human earlier migration that didn't contribute to modern humans at all. But all of the rest of the samples show this over time, like decreasing of Neanderthal ancestry fraction. So, and that, um, the work by these authors basically suggests that this is not due to uh, intermixing with some other human population that didn't have any Neanderthal input. This is just due to negative selection, essentially. So basically, this is showing that over time, there was a, a loss, essentially, of Neanderthal, Neanderthal genetic variants from these um, human populations, where these variants are being either actively negatively selected out, which seems to be the major influence, uh, but also through genetic drift and things like that, you can also lose these as well. So that does seem to be um, basically the condition where you have this uh, decrease over time. Um, yeah, so I think it is, it is very likely that you could have um, more of this fraction in the later stages of the upper paralytic and then have less of it today. Does that answer your question? I hope. I hope. <laughs> On the other hand, the, the, the uh, Tina Warner's current thinking, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. See, see, seems to possibly be, and this is work that they're, they're now undertaking, is that ac actually some of this, um, some of these bacteria may have been um, useful health-wise. Right, so right. The question right. is, uh, why, why weren't they selected for and continue, I guess? I'm jumping the gun because we don't know how the results, basically, of their study. Right, but... right. Well, I think, I think that's something that I kind of have, especially with these immune-related things, you kind of see this repeatedly. Like, I, I found these variants that seem to have been under positive selection, but are associated with COVID risk now. So I think for some of these immune phenotypes, and you know, in the case of those bacteria, in the case of these, especially these immune variants that I was studying, where, you know, in effect, a, a change in their expression could be good because you're maybe increasing the sensitivity to fight some sort of disease. But if you make it too sensitive, and COVID nineteen comes along, now you have this like exuberant response, which is very damaging. So I think a lot of it is these kind of. Uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad situations. And depending on the particular stimuli, it, it, it changes the direction of that. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's like a classic that. example of like a mismatch, right? You know, like yeah. under positive selection that becomes maladaptive or whatever. Um, exactly, exactly. Hmm. Cool. Ozzy, did you have a question? Um, yeah, actually I, I did. I, I enjoyed the talk. Thanks, thanks a lot for this. Um, the question is really about the kind of theoretical framework in which um, the um, introgression of Neanderthal genes would make sense. And that generally is an appeal to novel environments outside of Africa um, that people had to adapt to and that this was essentially um, getting genes that were already adapted to those environments and benefiting from that. 
The question then is whether the data really supports that because from the point of admixture onward, the people supposedly, the admixed individuals would now be in those novel environments. And yet in many cases, there's no evidence of selection for genes until considerably later in time. And I wondered if you could comment about that. Right, right. So I think it's, I think it's, you know, you're, like I said, there's kind of these dueling forces happening, right? We see definitely this negative selection. That seems to be actually the major thing that's happening. Uh, but it's also undeniable that, or it seems that there's also this small fraction of positive selection as well. Um, and I think the kind of argument for, yes, you now have, these individuals are now living in this environment, themselves so you know they could potentially develop their own adaptations but as we know evolution is so is slow and relies on these random mutations so the time scale is just such that it you know it's kind of like the the theory is that the neanderthal variance is kind of a jump start on that so neanderthals are living in the environment for about you know 10 times as long as the period between the uh, humans getting the gene flow and undergoing positive selection so i think there, there's definitely some element of, you know, the of uh, these these uh, haplotypes just kind of segregating mutually, and then this new immune stimuli comes along that makes them beneficial. So there's a question of yeah, some of that could be that Neanderthals were actually adapted to that environmental stimuli, and some could be that you have some sort of new uh, uh, Exaptation or something like this of, of the variant itself. Um, yeah, I think I think a lot more work needs to be done on that. But I think there is. Uh, it seems to be that there's some element of both things happening. Uh, the, the other thing that also I didn't mention in terms of these like immune stimuli, there was this um, good paper that came out, um, an art and Petrov are the authors, and they kind of, they pose a framework where particularly the immune stimuli is the viruses carried by Neanderthals themselves. So the argument is that Neanderthals would be carrying, you know, you know, like as we see with all the cases of, you know, human population contact where the populations have different diseases, actually maybe the Neanderthal uh, introgressed immune variants were responding to diseases that the Neanderthals were actually carrying in the case of that contact. But like you said, most of the selection does seem to be later. So maybe that accounts for some of the earlier cases. Um, yeah, I, I really think more work needs to be done on that, but it's, it's certainly an interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. All right, are there, there are any other questions? We're, we're, um, any other questions? I guess I'll hand um, Yeah, I have a question. Um, yes. Is, is there uh, anybody looking at whether these uh, COVID-related and aggressed variants or similar variants have any relationship or uh, to people that are higher risk for other types of cytokine storm, like people with septic shock? So I was wondering, maybe it's not just a COVID-related thing. It may be related to other people that have these hyper-exuberant uh, cytokine responses. Yeah, that is a great question. I haven't looked at that specifically, but th th that definitely seems to be the case because like, it's, these chemokine receptor genes are critical for all sorts of immune responses. So I think, I think that must absolutely be true. And that, that tends to be the thing in general where you'll get uh, you know, something that's associated with yeah, with a positive, with a good immune response, but also maybe increased allergy risk or asthma risk, which are like autoimmune issues, you know, issues of these hyper responses. So I, I think that has to be the case, but I, I just don't know the answer. Yeah. To so, so it seemed like if something like that were true and it were shown to be uh, the case, it might be something that, that could be developed into a useful medical test where you could check people to see if they were higher risk for, say, ending up at the ICU if they had a simple case of pneumonia. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then of course, also, so there's like the genetic test and then also the therapeutic being, you know, some yeah. sort of mitig like decrease to the, C the CCR1 response, you know, some, some ant antagonist to that or something. Yeah, yeah. so that, that research I know is happening. So I, I think uh, that's the direction that those are going, which is cool. super cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, well, in that case, uh, please join me in thanking Evie once again for a really wonderful and uh, impressive talk. Thank you so much. I was so happy to talk to you guys. Thank you for bringing me in, appreciate it. All right, thank you, thank you very much.
Thanks. All right. <laughs> See you next semester for uh, 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 the, the, the next portion of the colloquium series. Until then, uh, be good. All right. And if anyone has a question that comes to mind later, Ian has my email, so feel free. All Thank right. You, Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.